briefly introduce myself for the, anyone that doesn't, Mark Omer, Deputy Vice Chancellor and, and Provost. And, and I'm going to be introducing the session today before handing over to Kasaya, who, who will kind of uh, run it. I'll, I'm going to stay for the, the whole morning, but can't stay uh, for the sec second half. Uh, I think just to say, I mean, this has been our largest uh, festival so far in terms of an impact and, and engagement festival. And and so nine separate sessions covering working with business, so engaging with business, collaborative research development and opportunities to influence policy. There's obviously some people I can see who've had really significant uh, influence on policy, uh, collaborating on on kind of controversial issues. Again, people people present here done, who've done a lot of that and extending kind of health impacts. And really then sort of think about also the 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 next phase of the knowledge exchange framework which, which since last year obviously we, we've we've had the first results from the kef keel did did actually incredibly well in 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 several areas of, of the kef certainly compared with our benchmark group and that's exactly the group that we we would like to be benchmarked against as a university the the kind of uh, the non-Russell group, but research intensive universities, and we we kind of performed right at, at the top end of that in in some areas. Uh, and I think really, really just just from from my point of view to just emphasise, and it, and it is it's always a challenge in a university that is a small university which has a lot of things going on and is balancing education excellence and research excellence just the importance of, of the research agenda and the wider uh, impact and, and uh, engagement work that, that, that Kiel does. And I think we have come a long, a long way. We've got a long way to go still. Uh, it's across all three faculties, all discipline areas. And, but it is a really important part of Kiel's direct research activity. It's external engagement activities. We look to build partnerships. And just last night, I was in conversations uh, with with a couple of colleagues about building some significant external partnerships. And, and that comes from Kiel's sort of external engagement activities to build those, those strategic partnerships. I think it adds really significantly to our profile regionally and, and nationally and internationally. It probably gradually tapers on each of those, but nonetheless, some of our research and uh, external engagement activity really does have a genuine international profile. And in the end, if we're trying to increase our number of international students and, and attract them to Kiel, it will probably be the research impact that, that has as much influence on that as, as work done by international recruitment agents as we, we try and kind of increase Kiel's international profile. But at the moment, I think the regional the regional benefits are really significant in terms of the government lev government's levelling up agenda. The Kiel deals obviously done a lot to that. It, say it covers all areas from policy to direct engagement with with businesses. Uh, so I think it is kind of really important that we just really keep pushing on on this and we celebrate what are some outstanding areas of impact across the across the university that, that, we, that we have and use those as exemplars of best practice to kind of areas where we may not be, be quite so good. That. So I think that's all I'm gonna, gonna say. Uh, look forward to hearing the presentations uh, uh, this this morning, this morning, and just hand over to Kasaya, who's going to chair chair and, and introduce the sessions. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you to um, everyone who's just joined. Welcome out the speaker then as well. Um, so we're going to be opening with Cliff soon, um, and then we've got um, Helen Parr and um, Jane Christianish, and. We, we're going to have time for, set, uh, for questions after each presentation, but if you can please keep your microphones muted um, until then um, to help things run smoothly. Um, we've also got an afternoon session which will be starting at 12.30. Um, we've got colleagues from health, psychology, um, geography and business who will be talking about their research impact then. So if, um, if everyone or anyone can um, come along to that session as well, that would be great. Um, okay, so I'm going to pass over to Chris, uh, Cliff now, sorry. Um, so Cliff, if you could share your screen, that would be great. I'm trying to, but for some reason, unfortunately, all I'm getting is a little purple circle when I press the 
arrow. So I don't know what we're going to do because, oh, good, it's working now. OK, here we go. So that's uh, first technology crisis out of the way. OK, now hopefully, can you see that now? No, uh, let's try this. Is it going to work? Click, click, were. Hopefully you can see that now. Can I get a yes? Okay, yeah. I, can see a, I can see a head nod. Okay, yes, definitely so, a yes, click, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, morning, everyone. I, I, I thought uh, what might be useful today is just for me to provide a little narrative, a little story about the journey to impact, just to help frame some of the issues that I've had to confront and want to highlight in how one might go about achieving uh, what we might call a successful track record with impact. And I think um, for me, that's very much about um, the Keel academic collaboration, policing academic collaboration, which is in effect a strategic research centre that we've established at, at Keel um, uh, during my time here. But I, I want to begin that narrative by recognising that my track record as an academic has, has always been impact focused. And that was really before we even had the word impact. So my early career was very focused on trying to understand the dynamics of collective violence in crowd events. And through the analysis of that at the theoretical and research level, began to recognise that policing and the way that crowds were policed was a really important factor in transitioning peaceful crowds into ones involved in violent confrontation. So once that theoretical understanding was there, I felt that there was a responsibility as an academic to try to use that theory to inform police, to try to help them to understand how to manage crowd events more effectively, because it was clear that they were making significant mistakes that were actually producing disorder rather than uh, reducing it. Now that, that impact journey was, was, was quite long and, and quite significant from my PhD effectively onwards and was something that uh, was very much about uh, escaping the ivory tower of, of a pure abstracted level of, uh, of research. But that, that was prior to the birth of what we now live with, which is, is the impact agenda. And I just wanted to show a, a short video of, of, of that journey and some of the things that I'd achieved prior to, to, to coming uh, to Kiel. Now, if I can make this work, hopefully you can hear that as well. Stop. And uh, my area of research focuses on the social psychology of, of crowd behaviour. So we've only got to look to the Arab Spring and look to the crowd to understand the significance of what crowd events can become. People get arrested, people get criminalised, police careers can end uh, in, in an instant because of decisions that are made. The work that I do began with an ESRC funded studentship uh, back in 1989. And through that work, we began to understand that much of the conflict that we were witnessing in our research was brought about by particularly aggressive forms of policing. That set in motion dynamics of escalation in the crowd, creating the psychology of a riot. Police would wheel out the riot squad to show that they had the capacity to. Uh, to, to control these crowds. We fundamentally changed that because what we've shown is that actually the crowd dynamics involve the perception of the legitimacy of police in action. And those policing practices are not based on their deterrence and fear, they're based on their engagement and power.
Okay, so that, that gives you a, a flavour of, uh, of the work that I was doing prior to a, arriving at Kiel. Um, and I was fortunate enough to uh, receive the ESRC's Celebrating Impact Award, which was a very important recognition of, of, the, of the impact agenda. But this was only the second year that the ESRC was running that, that, that award. And at that time, it was very early in the impact agenda. There was no real formal recognition in the academic context for that outreach activity. It was something that had to pioneer in the absence of uh, any kind of formal recognition of, of the REF. And I think that that's a key issue for us as researchers. The, the impact is only important nowadays, I would argue, to the extent that you can measure it. And it's become important because of the REF. So in effect, you know, impact is, is there because we measure it with impact case studies. So by the time I landed here in 2016, I was already constructing an impact pathway, if you like, through my research, where I was based at, at Leeds University. But what we had to recognise, of course, is that while we can carry our academic papers with us, we can't carry impact, right? Because impact's tied to the institution. So what I had to do when I landed here was to start thinking immediately about constructing an impact case study at Keele. And I only had four years to do it. So that's a bit of a crisis point, really. Oh, my God, what am I going to do? So, you know, I had to construct REF submissible publications here that were located at Keele. I needed to track that evidence into, um, uh, track that into impact and produce uh, the, the evidence that directly link that research to the impact within four years, because you can't carry any of that other stuff with you. So a very limited time, uh, time frame. And the Kiel Academic Collaboration was, was a framework through which that was, I would argue, facilitated, um, because it created a framework of co-production. Um, and uh, when I came to Kiel, there was already a desire to, to develop the university in the arena of policing that I was able to, to, to harness and utilise to, to carry the, the project forward in a sense. So we set up uh, with, with key uh, support from, from people within the university, uh, the idea of the, peer, uh, the, the KPAC, the Kiel Policing Academic Collaboration. Um, I was able to draw on my existing prior networks with, with police forces, develop memorandums of understanding with them, um, and drew on the support of, of Anne Pittard in particular in, in DRY. And we launched KPAC in 27. And this gave us this foundational platform for co-production, which was there to try to produce these solid pathways to impact. And for me, it was very much then about this idea of bringing the practitioner into the research process at the beginning of that research. Not to see research as something we do in the university and then try to apply, but actually involve those practitioners from the outset to give the, uh, uh, the opportunity to facilitate that pathway um, in, into, uh, into practice. So we established these uh, key regional uh, partners in West Midlands uh, and, and Staffordshire in particular, uh, in the early stages of the, of the collaboration. Once we had that in place, we were able to launch. We've now got Warwickshire and, and other police forces that we've been uh, working with and so on. And we've got this formal structural relationship with these police forces that is very beneficial in terms of, of, of driving our research agenda forward. Um, but it has to be said, of course, that you know, impact is underpinned by good good science. It's not, you know, that we just do impact, that, 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 that we're having the impact because we're doing good science. And of course, our ability to achieve impact is dependent on our ability to attract uh, research funding from, in particular, the research councils. And to do that, you can't do that in isolation from the development of theoretical knowledge. So there, there has to be an underpinning agenda around good science. And for me, that's uh, about uh, taking a social psychological analysis that we call the social identity approach and applying it into the arena of policing and criminology. And in particular, the relationship between our social psychological theory and uh, criminological theory that people call uh, procedural justice theory. 
And a good uh, element of the traction of the development of our research agenda revolves around theoretical progress along this pathway of interaction that's interdisciplinary uh, in its orientation. And we were fortunate enough then, obviously, to, to capture uh, research grants. Um, uh, the first of those was an ESRC grant for three years, uh, looking at the, uh, the spread of the August 2011 riots. And that, that was a really important opportunity for us to develop some high-end theoretical and empirical contributions to the understanding of the dynamics of riots and how they should be policed. We also uh, managed to capture um, another ESRC grant uh, looking at uh, police citizen uh, interactions. And this is important because in part our study of the riots shows very clearly that there is a relationship between how police police the streets on an everyday basis, particularly in relationship with particular ethnic minorities and the social conditions under which uh, the psychology that makes rioting possible emerges. So it's given us an opportunity to develop and progress uh, those ideas um, and, and, and that research agenda. And we've recently uh, expanded again through another ESRC uh, grant, uh, looking at how crowds behave um, in situations where there are uh, marauding terrorist attacks of the kind that we saw, uh, unfortunately, in London, um, around London Bridge, you recall that, that uh, awful scenario. So there's quite a lot of uh, research work going on uh, there uh, that, that, that is funded. Uh, again, we recently captured a UKRI grant looking at uh, um, policing in the, in the context of, of, of the pandemic. But then it, it, it's not research that's exclusively um, focused on, on research council funding because we also recognise that in this environment, it's important to uh, attract funding from uh, organisations that we're trying to, to influence. So we recently captured a, a consultancy type grant from the English Football League looking at the policing of football. And this architecture of funding and collaboration, uh, I would argue, is really, really important to, to my impact agenda because it, it creates that underpinning uh, framework of relationships that, that makes the, the, the impact agenda um, uh, achievable in a sense. But having said that, it's also important to recognise that within what we do within KPAC, uh, dissemination uh, is absolutely pivotal. And we've, uh, as a consequence, run several um, what we call CPD events. And I just want to show you a short piece of video of one of those. We heard something and then it stopped. Really makes this event successful. Um, our talks have been well received, and uh, I'm looking forward to the future. Uh, okay, uh, I'm sorry, I just got a chat message there that said you couldn't hear that. Um, I hope you could, um, but not to worry, it's, it's too late in a sense. 
Um, but hopefully, um, w w what I was um, w what I was trying to to convey there was that, to some extent, uh, a key issue for us in the construction of our uh, impact uh, case study was this interrelationship between the research funding, the theoretical development, and then the practical dissemination to practitioners. Because for me, in a sense, the impact was a bit of a lottery. And that lottery uh, was achieved, uh, achieved a kind of success through one of these dissemination events that we ran at Kiel that happened then to attract some uh, very uh, influential senior police commanders and practitioners, uh, in particular in the College of Policing. And those uh, practitioners, hearing our evidence and theory, then went away and redesigned the national curriculum for public order police commanders. And uh, then we were able to uh, work with them to produce a testimonial to that effect that gave us the evidence that we needed. Uh, then, in addition, uh, we, we were also through our collaborations and, and so on that we'd engineered into uh, West Midlands Police, we're able to draw a testimonial from uh, one of the chief officers in West Midlands Police to, to evidence um, the extent to which they drawn on our research and theory to influence their practices around the policing of football. So within this four year period, it was that opportunity to evidence that was absolutely central uh, and necessary for us to provide the evidence that we needed to, to feed into the impact case study. And it was only really through that interrelationship that we got to the point uh, by 2020 of having both the underpinning research publications that we needed for the impact case study, but also uh, the actual impact that that uh, research had achieved as evidence through these 10 key pieces of uh, evidence that we were able to structure uh, through through our partnerships and, and enjoy uh, through through our partnerships. So across that four year period, then there, there was effectively a journey and that, that journey to, to impact occurs in, in a context. And that context is the universities that we work in and the university environment that we work in uh, is, is increasingly begun, coming to see impact as important because it's part of its overall agenda around um, you know, metrics. You know, metrics, it has to impact case studies about performance in the ref, Performance in the ref is critically pivotal to our performance in the marketplace, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So our impact agenda is fundamentally about that. It sits within it, and we have to harness that agenda in order to feed it into a way that enables us to produce the impact that we're actually um, always being committed to within the framework of our careers. But the, the, the windows in which that recognition is given are relatively narrow. For me, at an individual level, it was the ESRC Celebrating Impact Prize that accredited my career as something important at making a contribution. Uh, but since then, the, the agenda has shifted and becomes about the impact case studies, which are really, really fundamentally important. Um, in order to achieve that, uh, for me, it was very much about strategically focused collaborations and infrastructural support. It was the support that flowed from Kiel into the construction of KPAC, the financial support that we were able to engineer to support a centre manager that flowed initially from uh, the PVC for research, but then from the exec dean that cemented itself into a more permanent position that underpins our capacity to produce the work that we do in, in, in KPAC. Without that, we would not have been able to achieve the impact case study, the impact uh, that we, we've achieved uh, through the centre. And in, impact is a journey, and I think that journey can be a lottery. It's, you know, it was very, very difficult to predict what was going to happen. We didn't know that those people from the College of Policing were going to come to our session. We didn't know what it was that they were going to pick up on as important. We couldn't predict what they harnessed and flowed into uh, the revisions in, the, in their practices and policies. But it was by creating an infrastructure where we increased the probability that change can happen, that change ultimately did happen, and we were able to jump in there, harness it, evidence it, and flow it into the impact case study. So my, my ultimate conclusion really is that, that co-production is a really, really powerful tool. 
It's about getting co-production into the framework of the research production process, making sure that the practitioners are in there from the outset, building collaboration into the foundation of your research because it amplifies the speed and the reach of any impact your work might achieve and empowers your capacity to generate research, ev the evidence of that impact that you can flow back in uh, to, in a sense, prove that you're having the impact that you, 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 your work um, you know, is, is actually generating. Um, so for me, they're, they're, they're the key lessons. I hope they're, they're useful reflections uh, uh, for you. Um, and I'm happy to uh, take a few questions and, and discussions on that. Thanks very much. Hopefully it's going to let me stop sharing the screen now. But uh, Kezia, I've got the blue blue window, so you might need to take control. Okay. Oh. Does that work, Claire? Yeah, it seems to have gone from my screen, thankfully. Okay. Um, so has anybody got any questions for Cliff? Um, you can either unmute your microphone or if you if you don't want to speak, you could write into the chat. Oh, I can see Toby's got his hand up. Hi there. Yeah, it's very interesting, Cliff. Um, I'm just wondering how you, you balance um, the the, um, the objectivity, because when, when you start becoming a, a special advisor for, for the police, um, does that does that influence at all uh, how how you might be seen by the protesters or something? Because it, 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 it's very interesting that this this area of research. But I'm just wondering, you know, how, how you because because obviously you're a you're a, a very trusted figure with the with the police with, with, with that. But I'm just wondering, um, does that does that influence at all how that how protesters see you and what kind of um, dialogue and discourse do you have with the uh, uh, with with, um, with with some of the people who might might be on the other side? Yeah, I think it's a very important issue. Um, you know, as the career progress has, as, 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 you know, as the career has developed, it's becoming increasingly police focused because that's my agenda. It's about police reform. Sure. But the nature of the reforms that I want to drive do have a level of credibility in the protest community because they're about human rights, they're about police legitimacy, they're about trying to engineer circumstances where the police are less likely to use disproportionate force. So that there is a kind of legitimacy agenda in there that is acceptable to uh, people in, in the protest community, but inevitably by working with the police to summon the protest community, you become the enemy. So, you know, that, that, that that's very uh, difficult. Yeah, I was talking about that. But, 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 yeah, but you could be actually seen as a go-between figure, you know, it's because if well, you're I think, yeah. reform, then they, they, they could actually see you as being someone who could take messages across to them. For, so so it, it, it could actually be, uh, you, know, you know, a really positive thing, couldn't it? It, it can be, but I, I think the, 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 the other issue that your question raises, because you deployed the term objectivity, I think is also an important one. Because for me, I, I think the struggle I have uh, at a scientific level is also a, a struggle over the scientific model that I deploy. I'm not a positivist, all right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not necessarily interested in producing what we pretend to be objective truth. What I'm interested in producing is a knowledge product. And that knowledge product wants to have a social value, a use. And I'm getting knowledge into an environment where that knowledge affects practice in progressive ways. So, so for me, the, 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 the success is the impact. Mm. Right? The success is the change. So I draw on concepts like participant action research, where, 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 the, where, the, where the value is the change itself, not whether I produce a four-star publication or not. And, and, and that's, for me, part of the tension because I don't produce four-star publications. I'm not really in that business. And there is, there is a, a kind of tension that emerges in the rest environment because in a sense, you've got to do both. You've got to do four-star publications and you've got to do impact. And unless you're kind of singing and all the song sheets, you're, you're kind of a failure. Yeah, there's always these trade-offs, aren't there? Yeah, it's, 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 sometimes if you pull in one direction, it compromises the other. But um, yeah, yeah, so, so, so th th therein lies the, the, the challenge, I think. But thanks. Thanks, okay. thanks Cliff. Um, really appreciate that. Um, Mark. Yeah, I think it actually just 
follows on from how you ended your uh, your 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 answer to uh, Toby really, and, and I mean I think you you said and emphasised that impact absolutely has to be based on high quality research, whether that's in scientific area or social science or or in in the humanities, and and that does kind of uh, give that potential tension between trying to achieve four star uh, research outputs and and really high quality impact and the number of people that probably do that is probably rel relatively small and they probably have Nobel prizes associated uh, with them I, I mean I would say it's clearly not stopped you getting very significant research council funding which shows that you don't always need the four star outputs to do that but I was I was interested in, in you kind of you kind of your kind of advice that you 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 kind of can't predict that it will happen you can do things where you significantly uh increase the probability of it so i think when when the impact agenda first got a bit a bit more real for for people through the ref in terms terms of it actually having some financial direct financial consequences associated with it there was then the danger that that lots of researchers academics would start being very busy running around trying to create impact in a, a fairly kind of unstructured way and actually probably deterring or deflecting from their actual research mission and probably danger of not only not having impact but also not achieving four star outputs which is the worst of of all scenarios so I guess it's just a bit of kind of thought on on one balance of time between the high quality research and trying to create the impact and have that that really meaningful impact in terms of reach and significance and two the things that you do to really significantly increase the probability of of having the impact okay so uh, complex array of, of issues there uh, mark um i i think um the, the, my first response would would be about the the importance of of having a clear strategic framework for the unit of assessment and, and recognizing that the impact that we're trying to achieve isn't occurring at the individual level, but it's part of a team. So within that team, you've got people who might be more focused on producing the four star publications and others who are more focused on perhaps generating the research impact. But it relates to a core strategic area of coherence within that unit of assessment that's both capable of producing the research outputs and the impact together and not seeing it as so focused on individual entrepreneurship, which I think is the model that we've been forced to work to up to now, where, where we look at our successful impact case studies, we have them because we've got individuals who've gone above and beyond to craft them, often in the absence of, of a clear strategic framework. Now, that's no, no peculiar or idiosyncratic failure. I think it's just an issue that we need uh, to to attend to because it, it's i think within that sort of level of strategic investment that we can then um produce the uh, or increase the likelihood that we will secu secure the impact that we need to achieve but for me i think as well it's about recognizing the areas in which we're trying to achieve impact so for example i don't think we would want to adopt uh, the same strategy for for example an industrial impact that we are trying to adopt in relationship to policing. Because a lot of my agenda was very much about trying to get the police to do things that they don't necessarily want to do. That there was actually quite a lot of resistance to my research and what I'm trying to do with my research. Um, and there's lots of people in the police who don't want policing to go in the direction that our research suggests that it should. So there's no kind of guarantee there because of that level of resistance. That may be true in an industri industrial context as well. But as I say, I think it was for me, it was very, very difficult. So what I did in the early stages was to flood everything heavily into uh, an agenda around trying to influence football policing. And that was partly because the lack of clarity from the ref about, um, you know, how was the impact in this cycle different from impact in the in the last cycle? So I was worried that I couldn't use, you know, the things that I'd done before as a kind of continuation, A, because it wasn't done at Keel, and B, because it had been, in a sense, submitted to the last ref. 
So I try to craft it out of football, but that's not actually where the majority of the impact occurred. It occurred haphazardly from this conference that we did that was funded by the money that we got to do the research around the August 2011 riots. And then it was just picked up. So we were able to then sort of flow into that and adjust the uh, case study as we went along. And in the end, then we got the Hong Kong IPCC piece. Then we got bits of work that were very, very unpredictable. But because we put the right, I put the right strategy in place, if you like, that there were the measurable um, six publications, and we could track that into a different array of evidence that we were able to pull the case study together and, and deliver it at the end of the cycle. But as I say, that I mean, for me, it was just really, really difficult because it had to be done in a four-year cycle because I didn't get here till 2016, and I couldn't draw on anything that I'd done before, so I had to construct that here in the first instance. And as I say, I think part of the challenge that we've got here is trying to uplift and make it more strategic within the unit itself and not be so reliant on individual members of staff to craft this for themselves. And that's about a kind of strategic team based approach to the unit of assessment and how we build the strategy for our research moving forward in the next cycle to make sure we're not as dependent on, um, on on individuals or indeed try to be, you know, increase the probability that we're going to hit what we need to hit in the next cycle. I hope that makes sense anyway. Thanks, Cliff. Um, I can see Jamie's just had um, one question in the, the chat. I'm aware we're sort of eating into Helen's time and she has to leave as well, I think. So can you quickly answer um, Jamie's question about practitioner articles? Is that something that you do? And then we'll pass over to Helen um, so you can get your, your presentation in, Helen. Uh, sorry, it's in the chat, is it? Do you, uh, yeah, so Jamie just says, um, do you also write practitioner articles to quantify dissemination? Um, I, I do a lot of uh, practitioner articles, yeah. I think some of the most in influential articles I've ever written have been practitioner publications, not academic ones. Uh, you know, I, th I think they're, they're absolutely pivotal um, and, and are often more important than the research, uh, uh, you know, article. I, I mean, if I'm, if I'm frank, the only reason I write academic articles is because I have to. You know, it, you know what I mean? It, it's, it's like you have to publish, publish or, or perish in a sense. But, you know, uh, as I say, the, 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 the work that I do actually is much more about engagement with practitioners. I'm, I'm very, very impact focused. So uh, practitioner articles are absolutely central. I hope that's okay, Jamie. Was there another question, Kezia? Um, no, I think it was just lots of agreeing with the things that you're saying. Um, okay. If anyone does have any other questions, I don't know if Cliff can stay around till sort of the end of the session, um, but it might be that we can have sort of a fuller discussion at the end of all of the presentations. Um, so thanks very much, Cliff. I'm going to pass over to thanks. Helen now. Uh, <laughs> pass over to Helen now. Um, so over to you, Helen. Hi, uh, thank you. And uh, that was extremely interesting. And this is completely different, which uh, <laughs> I suppose is a uh, part of the point. Um, hang on, let me just see if I can. Um, have you got the. Have you, can you see the. Um... Yeah, it's in uh, presenter view rather than screen view, but... Oh, that's annoying. Um, it doesn't matter, though. It, it looks fine. Yeah. OK, <laughs> I'll go with that. I've completely lost sight of all of you as well, so I'll just have to uh, ensure that... Uh, I'll just have to assume that you're all still there. Um, <laughs> so, um, so this is... This is com completely different sort of impact story from the one that we've just heard um and it probably is much more of a uh a sort of individual um individual based uh impact journey if we want to put it like that um so i started the research that eventually became this book in 2012 and the book was published in 2018 as Our Boys, the story of a paratrooper, as you can see um, there. It was published by Alan Lane. And, um, and I guess 
that was my fourth multiplier. That was what enabled me to sort of reach a, a, a much larger audience. Um, the impact happened after the book was published, and perhaps that's why it's a sort of this is a relatively unusual story. Um, it the impact sort of came from <laughs> the the publication of the book. So the book was reviewed throughout the national press. It got quite a high profile. It was one of the 10 biggest reads of the autumn in The Guardian, for example. The Observer did a profile interview with me. Um, and in the next year or so, I did um, sort of over 30 public talks, uh, or radio uh, appearances, including uh, Start the Week, for instance. So the impact case study could then be built on the basis of what happened after the book had been published. Um, and where what I thought Cliff said was quite strikingly is that I really didn't know what to expect. So the impact happened relatively spontaneously after the book was published. So I guess I guess I knew that something was likely to happen after the book was published, but I didn't know what it was going to what it was going to be. Uh, and the impact kind of case study then could result from the spontaneous reception that I received to the book um, as I then began to receive correspondence from people who'd read the book um, and probably about, I don't know, 100 or so people have written to me um, and sort of told me about how the book has affected them, how it's made them reflect on, um, on their own experiences. So this is a sort of slightly illustrated talk, not just about the, the impact journey, although it's, it's mainly about that. So what's the book about? Um, the book is a social and cultural history of the Parachute Regiment and the Falklands War. Uh, so it focuses on that particular group of elite infantry, infantry soldiers. It tries to understand what their experiences were, and it put those experiences into uh, social and military contexts. So the context of the 1970s and 1980s British society, because lots of men who went into the ranks of the parachute regiment uh, grew up in very hard circumstances, and the context of the uh, training and mentality of the um, 19, late 1970s, early 1980s uh, parachute regiment. So that picture, uh, some of you might recall it, it's from the 1980 BBC uh, documentary about the parachute regiment, um, sort of gives you a flavour of uh, the sorts of things that they did in training. Um, so it, it then goes and looks at what the parachute regiment did in the Falklands, where there was a lot of um, sort of close quarters combat, which was an experience that had a lasting impact for lots of the people who took part. So most of the book is about the experiences of uh, soldiers, but it's also about the impacts of, of, um, of death in the Falklands on family members. Um, and it's also a sort of a reflection on the commemoration of war more generally in Britain. And I also wove it into a story about my own family. And in many ways, that was a starting point for the research. So my family is not a military family but my uncle was a private in the parachute regiment who was 19 when he was killed in the Falklands. Um, and that's, so that's actually, that's a picture that was on the front cover of the book um, there. Uh, you can see is my uncle playing uh, in the garden uh, as a small child with a rifle, uh, sort of ideas there about uh, 1970s masculinity and social class uh, and, there's a small picture of me as a baby, just in case you needed anything to sustain your interest. Um, so I conducted interviews with uh, uh, quite a lot of um, former soldiers and, um, and also with family members of men who were killed in the Falklands. And I tried to convey in the book what those experiences were within the context in which they happened. So the book wasn't a kind of compendium of people's experiences, which I think lots of uh, more standard military histories are. Um, but I think um, I think I tried to do two things. I tried to listen to the emotional register in which people told me about their lives. And then I tried to express that in language. And secondly, I came to understand something that I hadn't previously understood. And that was that the British Army and specifically the, the regiment, the parachute regiment, was central to how people understood what happened to them. And that 
insight um, enabled me to make probably the main argument in the book, which was that for those soldiers, the military regimental and masculine identity formed in training was integral to how they understood what had happened to them. Um, and now when I look back on the sort of development of the impact case study, it was that argument and um, sort of making explicit that understanding that was intrinsic to them and their lives, but perhaps not obvious to other people, um, that probably enabled the book to have the, um, the reach that it did. So just a few sort of photos from the Falklands, which kind of illuminate, I think, the common ways in which people think about the Falklands War. Um, this is the, the sort of the endurance, carrying heavy packs across a hostile terrain. Um, that's a photograph that was given to me by uh, another former soldier. And he said, I don't know if you can quite see it there, but there's a, a a beret, a parachute, parachute regiment beret sticking up at the corner of the trench that they built. And um, it, it, using the photo to sort of show what I mean about the regimental and the masculine identity, because what he said was the beret makes you bulletproof. So their belief in the power of their training and in the power of the kind of historical regimental identity is what gave them the faith in themselves to uh, to go into into close quarters combat. And there's my uncle before he was killed, wearing his bulletproof beret. So the impact developed after the uh, book was published, uh, partly because of the sort of quite unusual media coverage it received, and um, and partly through the public engagement I did, uh, but also via the correspondence that I got. And um, I stress, I was genuinely extremely surprised, uh, both by the volume and the nature of the correspondence that I received. I didn't solicit the correspondence, it was, it was all sent to me. Um, some people, after they contacted me, I followed up to ask for more information. In a couple of cases, that resulted in me having a phone conversation. Um, two of the correspondents I wrote to subsequently attended a workshop I organised. Um, but most people who got in touch with me, I think, got in touch with me just because they wanted to tell me uh, how the book had affected them and how it had made them re reflect on their own experiences. I, I really wasn't expecting this. I, I didn't know how people would receive the book once it, once it came out. Uh, but a lot of the people who did write to me um, did so in, in quite an emotional way. And I think what emerged from that was that reading the book and, um, and actually lots of people who wrote to me said, I don't normally read books or I've never managed to finish a book about the Falklands before. Uh, but I, you know, but they had read mine and, and it affected them. Um, they, they felt like it sort of reflected something that was true. Um, uh, and I think, therefore, you know, what I could say in the impact case study was that it had quite a profound impact on their own processes of reflection and even potentially their own sort of processes of, of, of healing. So I'm just going to read out um, three of the responses uh, that I had um, just to give you a sort of a flavour of the kinds of things that people said. So the first one was uh, from a man who served in the parachute regiment, um, not in the Falklands, but in Northern Ireland. Um, and he said, it's taken me 30 years to come to terms with my time there. Your book not only confirmed a few things about me in the 1980s, but it helped my youngest daughter, who was born after I left the army, better to understand who I am and therefore who she is. I'd like to think that one day her elder siblings might do the same in order to reconcile their parents' past and their differences. I wanted to say thank you for helping me to let go of things that I should probably never have had hold of in the first place. And the second um, response was from a, a, a man private in the parachute regiment, like my uncle, uh, who said this, I joined the regiment because I was a restless child from a poor working class background who loved to read, in particular adventure, science fiction and history. Having dyslexia and being poor meant I was nearly sent to a special school. My dad died of a sudden heart attack one New Year's Eve at the age of 39, leaving my mum with my six-year-old brother, my sister and me, 
an impulsive youth of 15 who had already been in trouble with the police. The Paras was the new army, join and be a professional. That was the slogan, ha. I'm now father to three daughters. I'm still in trouble, even at 60. Anyway, your book stirred up a lot of feelings and memories. I still miss a certain person, suicide. Another mate also died of a sudden stop, having jumped off a Cardiff block of flats. We stole Weetabix from a store on the Norland because we could. But I have a little girl who I love dearly and will have to live until she graduates. I suppose what I'm trying to say is, Thank you for remembering us. And a final reflection, um, which is slightly different, uh, but also interesting, um, was from a man who'd served in the Special Forces. And he, he said, it's made me look at the war itself in a different light and made me question how I've handled the consequences, having taken part in that war and indeed subsequent conflicts. I thought I had compartmentalized the experiences of war and particularly down south. However, I realize now that there are many elements of that war that I'd not considered, especially on the families. And he went on to explain how he'd thought that death in battle would be an honor and that how he'd assumed that his own mother would be fine um, if he himself died. And he said, it was only after I read your book and how you described the chapters in part three that I actually, for the first time in my adult life, thought about the consequences of such self-centered selfishness. Your words moved me to tears, partly because I knew a lot of the lads whose deaths you cover and the impact it had on their families and of course yours, but also the stress and suffering my own mother must have felt and my own indifference to it. It's quite a sort of striking response in a way. Um, and it must have, I don't know, quite a, a tough thing for him to, to, to talk about, I would have thought. So one of the things I could say in the in the impact case study was to draw on uh, the evidence that was given to me in these responses um, to say that, you know, that, that reading the book, which came from the research and the way in which I sort of tried to write it, but also I think um, the insights that the research enabled me to have, um, which is where I think there is a sort of crossover with what Cliff was saying earlier. Um, it, it enabled then people to understand themselves in a slightly different way. Um, somebody said, you explained us to ourselves. Uh, and that kind of helped to prompt a sort of uh, process of reflection or, or possibly also of healing. So as well as the responses that I had from individual soldiers, um, I also, again, I wasn't necessarily expecting this, but I also did or have subsequently done quite a bit of engagement um, with uh, officers in the parachute regiment and also in the British Army. I mean, one thing that somebody has said is, is that they were genuinely surprised that someone like me could write a book that resounded with them in the way that it did. And that made them uh, much more receptive to it than I think perhaps they were expecting. And actually, you know, they, they've they sort of shown a willingness or a desire to engage with it um, uh, to the extent that apparently now it's um, standard reading at Sandhurst for officers who want to join the parachute regiment. The Colonel Commandant of the parachute regiment told me that he, he's made it compulsory reading because it's the only book that will give them an insight into the ethos of the regiment and, and the men that they're going to command. Um, and some of the responses I had after giving talks to officers at the parachute regiment, um, to another regiment and at the Army Senior Training College was that it helped them to understand the potential links between the um, inculcation of masculine and regimental identity in training and subsequent responses to, to battle. So it, it's not like they're saying they're going to adopt certain different practices but that what they were saying was that it prompted them to have some kind of deep reflection on 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 what they have done and the way that they have done it and the assumptions that they um uh that they that they make and so i also think there's been some impact on a uh, public understanding of soldiers responses to battle and the way in which uh, wars are commemorated in in britain so there's some uh she 
photo photographs from um, uh, my uncle's funeral. So the Falklands War was the first time that uh, bodies um, uh, from the war zone were, re were repatriated and buried in Britain. So it's a practice that we became very familiar with during the wars in Iraq and Af Afghanistan. But prior to the Falklands, um, bodies were buried where they had fallen. You know, that sort of idea of a corner of a foreign field that is uh, forever England. So one of the arguments of the book was that, that the Falklands is sort of on this bridging point um, where uh, public interactions with commemoration of war begin to change. And there's some photos from the Falklands. So I, as well as this kind of the public talks from which I was able to gather evidence of, um, of public, uh, of members of the public's kind of responses and thoughts about uh, the work, I also was able to organize uh, several workshops at which members of the armed forces were present. Uh, and the final one of those, um, I co-organized with my former PhD student, Eleonora Natale, and she had done field work in Argentina with Argentine members of the armed services, uh, which is uh, you know, a very courageous endeavor, uh, let's say. And through her work and mine, we managed to bring together British and Argentine veterans. And for some of them coming to that workshop, which we held at Kiel, um, it was the first time that they'd been in a room with sort of, well, for some of the British servicemen who attended, it was the first time they had met an Argentine uh, since they were in the Falklands. And it was quite a sort of emotional and difficult for the thing for them to do. Uh, during the course of the workshop, it emerged that uh, one of the Argentine veterans, well, the Argentine veteran who was present, had actually been responsible for shelling a unit of Gurkhas and one of the Gurkhas who he had been shelling was also there in the room. Uh, and that was sort of, it, it, you could see it was a, a relatively emotional thing for, for those two men to meet. Um, so I think that just having the workshop and, and being able to put people with it within a, a framework that they wouldn't otherwise have been in or and wouldn't have anticipated it helped to kind of prompt a sense of uh, reconciliation. So this is one of my favourite photographs ever. That's of Thatcher Drive in the um, in the Falkland Islands, uh, and perhaps it's sort of reflective of a, a generally uh, you know, commemoration of war is often done uh, within uh, quite standard nationalist frameworks. Um, and um, the Argentine who came to the workshop, he said afterwards. It made me see they are just the same as me. Um, and I think that's a quite a powerful way of thinking about maybe offering different frameworks for people to um, to uh, reflect on their own experiences, their, their own painful and difficult experiences. So just to conclude, I think um, this is maybe a relatively unusual impact case study and in and of itself it probably can't be replicated but i i needed it was only possible because i had i had the time to develop the research and that required me to i suppose put a bit of faith in the fact that something would come out of it eventually and and it did um and now what i'm hoping to do sort of moving forward um, is um, I'm working on a AHRC grant application for a social history of death in military service since 1945, which I think will be able to kind of to move forward with some of the things. You know, if I get the money, it will be able to kind of move forward with some of the things um, that have emerged in the um, in the course of doing this work. OK, that's it. I better stop sharing, but I've actually lost the team screen. So I'm not sure if I can. Hang on, that's it. it. Has that stopped the sharing? Yes, it has. Thank you, Helen. Um, has anybody, if anyone's got any questions for Helen? Oh, Cliff, go ahead. Hi, Helen. Lovely story. I mean, I, I, I took the liberty of, I have, I have to admit, I haven't actually bought the book, but I have now. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> absolutely fascinating uh, story. So I'm definitely going to treat that as holiday reading. Um, it, it is a lovely story as well, sort of about the sort of emotional journeys of, of those uh, soldiers. And I really um, resonate with the way in which 
uh, when people in the military read your book that they were surprised by it because you know how you know that sort of position you know how how can an outsider understand this and that you'd managed to um, explain their experiences for them which was a really powerful impact but could you tell us a little bit more about how how that how that impact was articulated in in an impact case study what 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 was the actual impact there yeah i mean what i said in the impact case study was that the impact is on individuals um being able then to sort of because some of the things that people actually said just spontaneously when they wrote to me was that you know you changed my mind about this or it made me see this differently and then I could I could use that um well I, I used it in the impact case study to to argue that it has prompted kind of deep reflection and therefore healing and therefore impact on on well-being and that was that that was the mainstay of the um of the argument in the impact case study and then you know then there were the sort of the subsequent elements about you know so I, I couldn't point to changes in practices in parachute regiment training but then you know I think that would be quite a big ask if I'm honest um, but I could point to you know specific pieces of evidence where commanding officers you know the commanding officer of the parachute regiment the colonel commandant of the parachute regiment said things like this made us reflect on um, the way in which we train are so I, you know I, I couldn't claim and I wouldn't claim to have had a policy impact as such the claim was on the sort of the reflection um, and the way in which it helped people to see things differently okay thanks lovely so I, I can see um, in the chat Jane has asked um, basically whether you found it difficult to balance the emotions um, in translation to the impact case study. So obviously the responses that you got were very emotional and whether you found that difficult to, to sort of put into words or... Yeah, it's a really good question and yes, I did. <laughs> I found it difficult throughout the... I, I actually think that... Um, uh, I think in some ways... The hardest thing was receiving correspondence from people. So when I interviewed people during the course of the research, um, that was obviously emotional. But because you're there with them, there's a sort of context um, where, you know, it's all sort of, you have that human interaction. But I, I found it when people started to write to me and want to tell me their stories. And it was kind of it was after the research had finished in a way. So I didn't really have a framework for. For, for doing that um and uh, uh but i you know on a human level if someone writes to you and kind of tells you about their friends being killed you have to respond um that i think that part of the, the year after the book was published was the hardest thing um and i wasn't anticipating that at all i thought yeah i've done the work now but no like the work is just is just beginning so writing the impact case study was easier than 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 because there's, there's no framework for doing that That's yeah. uh, so i'm laura i've just start, well just started sorry i i don't know if someone else is asking a question or I think somebody started talking, but I don't know who it was. Um, I can see uh, Georgina has got a hand up. Hi, uh, yeah. I just wanted to ask a question about the initial recruitment from obviously a very niche population who um, can be quite guarded. How did you find the initial recruitment, obviously, as an outsider? Um, it, well, I, 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 I it's sort of it was quite hard to get started but once I got started there was a snowball effect um and I think I you know I know I had this kind of personal connection and I think that was quite important in getting in but I actually don't think it was the reason why people were willing to talk to me I think the people who were willing to talk to me were people who wanted to talk and that kind of became 
you know, apparent. Um, anyone who agreed to be interviewed, I think, did so because there was something that they wanted to tell me. And it wasn't necessarily because it was me. It was because I would sit there, I, I sat and listened to them. Uh, um, so I think it was difficult to start. But once I had started, there was quite a strong snowball effect. Um, I could have done more interviews than I did. I had to stop at some stage as well. Thank you. Uh, I think we can have one more question if anyone else has got a question. Um, oh. No? Okay, um, thank you very much, Helen. That, that was really interesting. Thank you. Um, I, don't, I think you obviously have got to get off, I think you said, so um, maybe if anyone else has got... Any... Only before 12, I want to hear Jane as well, so... Ah, right, okay, okay, so if anyone has a question, you can ask after to Jane as well. Um, but I'm going to pass over to Jane now, um, so take it away, Jane. Thank you very much. Thanks for everyone for sharing their time at such a, a busy time of the year. I'm just going to share the screen. Um, and hopefully, are you able to see a PowerPoint there? OK, so um, yes, yeah, so my research, um, the research impact case study is CLOCK as an active application of a, the transformative methodology. So the transformative methodology is very much the framework um, for the impact. And I hope it's something that will be helpful um, to colleagues um, in thinking about whether it could be translated into other areas as well. Um, it was developed um, on the basis of my research in the post-earthquake area back in Maharashtra, India, back in the 90s um, as a time of crisis um, and, and of destruction. Um, and it was through my work in developing and thinking about ways in which to respond to those crises that's been translated from um, the framework um, in India to the current crisis in the UK when we think of austerity and particularly the significant withdrawal of legal aid. So the strategy um, is about a transformative methodology for access to justice um, and thinking about the relationship between structure and agency. So in both of those images, that notion that there was a phrase um, in Marathi, uh, Kai Karu, what to do? How do you move forward? And in both these instances, just thinking about ourselves as individuals um, and how do we actually move forward and effect change um, to be able to access justice. So this is very much theoretically framed um, across um, post-disaster literature, but also um, uh, right strategies. So from disaster literature, thinking about how we can learn about social processes where the disaster site is, is, is a place where we can look at policies, programmes and legislation as a site of social organisation of international state, non-governmental organisations and local community to analyse how social relations and organisations, particularly in which women were active, were constructed through rights. Um, and through that, looking at um, rights theory, so my research was based on deconstructing rights theory um, from the perspective of feminist um, critical theory to break down rights theory. So not to go into too much detail, but for those of you familiar with um, rights claims, thinking about claims of recognition, redistrib redistribution and relocation, these theories have been challenged in Indian feminist discourse um, as being based on a very hierarchical model. Um, and so drawing on post-colonial frameworks and feminist perspectives, I, I work to sort of break this down. Um, and this is very important in the legal structure because when we think about law from a feminist perspective, Audrey Lord's question for how can the master's tools dismantle the master's house? How can law really be effective um, to effect change? Um, so this is a question in feminist critical discourse in the West and feminist crit critical discourse in the East. And CLOCK is very much a feminist legal engagement to question whether rights actually reproduce patriarchal dominant sites of justice or can we engage with rights 
to constitute a multiple and relational force, an intersectional model which may effectively transform sites of justice. So in order to do this and to take an intersectional approach, it's very much about being on the ground. And I think listening to Clifford and, and to Helen, the notion of listening to voices on the ground has been absolutely key. Um, and my work was very much based when I was um, living in the earthquake affected area um, in the earthquake shelters for 44 years, um, listening to voices of women and developing um, sort of community legal awareness projects um, as a very reciprocal process um, and developing um, legal literacy projects. And I know this photo, this is a photo of Hem Kabai, um, um, who, who was very much a very strong leader within the tribal community. community. And it looks perhaps slightly sensational, um, you know, as she's in her tribal dress um, and sort of learning, you know, legal literacy with a notebook and pen. But I can assure you in our experience in the Stoke Court that I'm going to be speaking about the average reading age in Stoke is the age of seven. So the same challenges in being able to access and engage um, with legal strategies. Um, and within the four years of, of being in the earthquake area, it was looking at how the earthquake people engaged with law um, and ultimately through a public interest litigation case, which was led by Krishnadas Sukumaran. Um, and in that case, the, the villages actually took the government to the Supreme Court. And I think this newspaper article was just so influential um, on my understanding that this notion that the judiciary is, is the only hope. So this balance and, and, and sort of what was, was my um, dilemma was when we know law can actually be quite an oppressive force, particularly when we think of it as a patriarchal and a colonial structure, yet it also can be a liberating and empowering force to challenge um, the state. So engaging with um, critical literature in this area, thinking about Iris Marion Young's work, sort of how do we actually look at civil society as a place where we can challenge um, uh, you know, make, make these interventions um, and she looks at the relations in which individuals and groups stand to one another within civil society. Um, and this is how in that time sort of developing the notion of a transformative me methodology to restructure and remake the world where necessary. Kimberly Crenshaw is saying it's ironic that we start at the top and again we need to look at the grassroots to be able to look at those who are most marginalised in the centre, that's the way to be able to undermine um, and to develop political collective action. So going to the case study and the impact case study, there were three key, key papers that I'd um, developed on these three strands of breaking down those rights claims of recognition to reflecting agency, looking at rights claims of redistributing resources to how we could revalue capacity um, and a notion from relocation to revolution, this idea of moving beyond the domestic space and in the public space. So there were three core articles which culminated in an article in 2008, which was the key underpinning research, which brought those three articles together as the um, transformative methodology um, that actually if we could break these down to reflection, redistribution and relocation, this would be a mechanism to develop a collaborative structure, a relational model, an intersectional model, um, a transformative model for access to justice. So from those, the work in India, I developed, um, coming to Kiel, I developed a series of research grants um, to have an exchange across India and the UK. Um, and a particular research grant on innovations in research methodologies where we could develop the transformative methodology. And this was applied in the UK context um, for the withdrawal of legal aid um, and thinking about Crenshaw's quote about the most marginalised and in the Low Commission report, the, the sort of preamble, the call for action was how can society meet one of its heaviest responsibility, namely the responsibility to ensure its members who are least able to protect themselves are provided with the assistance they require to cope with the challenges they inevitably face. And working with women from a domestic violence refuge, going back to that initial um, image, thinking about how we could move forward. Um, and through um, listening to the voices of experience, the voices of experience was a group of women in Stoke, so very much compared to the work in India of working with women's groups, 
We developed this idea of having a role of a community legal companion, a student who would be trained to assist women um, going through the court process. Um, and this was developed with a collaborative partnership. So thinking about Clifford's you know, way of promoting this idea of co-creation and co-development. We developed a steering committee of the court, law firms, charitable sector, the YMCA, the Systems Advice Bureau, domestic violence and sexual violence services. And together we delivered training um, that would train the students to become community legal companions, to assist in the local court, um, to help people go through that court process. So reaching out and providing a bridge. And this was in 2012 and it developed in a, in a um, it came into action in 2013, um, operating in the Stoke Court. And in 2015, I was able to develop this into a, a web portal, um, which was actually much more of a web portal, because what it did was that it, it actually brought all of our partners together. So if you see this emblem, you can see in the first quartile of the clock, we have housing organisations, then we have family um, organisations, community safety organisations and welfare organisations. And in the centre of the dial are the legal, the, the solicitors. And the middle is the student community legal companion who's reaching out to assist people go through the court process. So this was actually mapped out within the clock portal to allow an electronic signposting system. So litigants in person could make an application to CLOCK and that would be signposted across the partnership. Um, and we followed this model um, of the transformative methodology where we'd have community legal education awareness. We would have the legal companion um, assisting to fill in court forms, arranging papers, informal proceedings, taking notes um, and providing moral support. And then we had a third section which would, would be to collate the data um, to be provided to inform policy and again I think this is again a really important learning point from the impact case study because though I didn't realize it at the time this has been a fantastic source to be able to document um, all of our cases so all of our cases are on the system um, and we've been able to contribute that data as I'll refer to in the final section so reflecting agency, what's the impact of the work that we've had? So a litigant in person referred to the legal companion saying without the legal companion, we wouldn't have had support at court. The support is fantastic. You, sh you can share your view and your say only. So a notion of it being empowering. Um, another litigant in person spoke about the massive safeguarding issues that were involved in her case, the fear of having unsupervised contact from a partner who'd been violent. The fact that legal aid was denied um, and that without, even though our ethos was to signpost for legal aid, the fact that legal aid wasn't available, the presence of the legal companion helped the litigant in person from drowning in the legal jargon of all the legal words. So again, going back to that image of the legal literacy and thinking about the impact in the local context. The impact on the court, so I, I needed to present a case to the court to allow them to, to gain permission for the legal companions to be accepted in the court process. Um, and the designated family judge, Perry, uh, noted the community legal companion carried out by Clock at Stoke provided invaluable in assistance to litigants in person whose voice might otherwise have not been heard in obtaining access to justice. So again, going back to that underpinning research about the voice, the marginalised person, and being able to have agency in the process. Um, the collaborative practice, thinking about revaluing capacity, the, the, all of those who are in that emblem of the clock, being able to work collaboratively together. Um, and the litigant in person in the middle was being able to access different services which otherwise wouldn't have been available to her. Um, so uh, this is a support worker noting that clock is a necessary service for vulnerable individuals who either cannot afford legal advice or aren't seen as eligible for support due to their unique circumstances. So over the period, um, you know, since 2013, we've been able to cascade clock to different court centres and this has been very much about the judges actually um, speaking to one another and encouraging um, other court centres to take on clock. And in order to do that, we've been able to cascade CLOCK to universities. So we've, trans we've, we've translated CLOCK um, across to 12 university law schools. 
Um, and they have spoken about this being a transformative experience sort of pedagogically um, in the way that they've now delivered the training. They now have steering groups uh, with their local partners. Um, and it, you know, they've been able to write about this in different publications. Um, so Moore and Newbury in their book wrote about um, the clock students um, thinking about LI LIPs being lost in the system and that they are a bridge. Um, and Lyndon Thomas in Reimagining Legal Education spoke about clock being an effective means of responding to the impact of cuts to legal aid. Um, and Ma Maria Muscati affirms clock noting that it does have a transformative impact on students, lecturers and litigants in person and the transformation it brings is adding a new element um, to access to justice. So this, for me, it's been a very transformative impact on my life and my role as an academic in being able to bridge the activist and the academia um, and having a network of collaborating partners both professionally um, and with, uh, within academia. Um, Mavis McLean, in her book, After the Act, spoke about CLOCK as being a virtuous circle of activity which benefits clients, students and the university, lawyers and the courts. And as I mentioned, CLOCK was very much a response to the significant withdrawal of legal aid. So our ethos is to try and get legal aid wherever possible um, and to um, create evidence based for the importance of legal aid. So. That's one element I can respond to in questions, but I was very anxious again thinking about that initial notion of going to law um, and, and the fact that we might be seen as a, a sticking plaster. The head of legal aid at the Law Society said in a radio interview, do you mind if I refer to you as a sticking plaster, Jane? And I said, well, no. Um, and in fact, I wouldn't even say that I'm a sticking plaster without the law pr profession. We wouldn't be able to stick. Um, Sabina Azima, a legal aid solicitor, notes we support CLOCK as it is an invaluable service within the area which has greatly assisted a number of people and critically in working with CLOCK we've been able to identify people who were unaware that they were eligible for legal aid and in some cases even identify and successfully apply for exceptional case funding. So again it's been so important for us to make sure that we are challenging um, the Ministry of Justice and the Legal Aid Agency to be able to demand legal aid where possible. Um, the third element of the transformative methodology when we think about reflecting agency, what, revaluing capacity, has been to relocate the public and the private sphere, which again is a real core of, of feminist critical theory. And what we noted in our um, the cases, so this is data from the web portal, was that though we'd envisaged that we would be signposting cases out to our professional partners and charitable services, what has actually happened is we've had an increased flow of cases coming in, and particularly from the public sector, the local authority children's services. So this has been a great area of concern and is something that's informing my current research now, um, because there's been a crossover with the public and the private sphere um, and a real concern about the impact um, on the fact that we've got very high risk factors coming in um, to um, the clock service. So I had submitted this evidence to the Ministry of Justice and it was um, reported in the Justice Cap where um, Eleanor Livingston wrote, clock is going as far to suggest that the lack of legal aid in some cases constitute a significant breach of public duty in relation to failing to safeguard the child against the risk of harm. Um, and we've also um, been able to submit our evidence to a range of um, government reports and, and public reports and parliamentary reports. So this was within the right to justice by the BAC Commission. Um, so a clear aim, this was actually written in 2013 as part of our launch when Mike Wolf, who was the first elected mayor of Stoke-on-Trent, wrote that um, even though um, we understood we couldn't turn back the clock on the legal aid cuts, it was important to have a well-evidenced case for a new legal aid scheme. Um, and David Holmuck of Oxford University also noted about the fact that it was a huge result a resource of huge importance for those who rely on the use of a national system. So we've actually, you know, 
remarkably through the collaboration of the professional partners obviously the students who've been involved as legal companions our academic network we have been able to inform the ministry of justice lasbo review um, and i had a letter which committed to the fact that there would be a comprehensive review of legal aid means testing that they would extend the eligibility for non-means testing in relation to um in the care arena so this is in the public care arena and also to expand legal aid to cover special guardianship orders. So really significant um, impact on the Ministry of Justice LASBO review, which is ongoing and also noted the excellent work that CLOCK does um, in being able to be a model for effective signposting coordinating coordination of legal support. We've also been able to make interventions in parliamentary debate, and this again goes back to that underpinning research. Um, again, it was the head of legal aid of the Law Society who came to the refuge and listened to the women. Actually, it was in the set in, in the basement of the refuge um, when they shared their um, experiences. Um, and he asked to pass on his thanks um, because it secured a successful a vote on um, the civil motion to regret. Um, as it provided hard examples to show the points that we and other representative bodies were making were real and not merely theoretical. And it's important to note that the founder of Voices of Experience is a member of our CLOCK steering committee. Um, and so we, we were very much reflecting her voice in the process. Um, back in 2014, um, CLOCK was included in the Good Practice Collection on Social Innovation in the European Parliament. And we've been very um, thankful to be able to, you know, through the research grants um, and the ongoing relationship with the universities in India, we've been able to develop, um, we had a, min a memorandum of understanding for the All India Access to Justice Strategy, which was rolled out by um, university law schools in India, particularly um, to assist in the post um, cyclone and the post floods. Um, in Kerala. So that was supported um, through the Global Challenges Research Fund. I think one of the most exciting elements of CLOCK as a transformative methodology is how it's been able to inform and translate to other areas of research. So this is something that I'm really keen to develop. Um, we were able to apply for the ESRC Collaborative Case um, award um, and fantastic to have Sophia Hyatt Taha as a PhD student who's now drawing on the transformative methodology in her work with the Citizens Advice Bureau for keeping women safe and in her work on um, no, no recourse to public funds. So as um, Sophia's PhD supervisor, it's really exciting and I'm really thankful to have her energy and her critical engagement in pursuing that going forward. And together we were able to produce a publication um, following COVID and um, thinking about the um, impact of COVID um, on the public and the private sphere again. Um, and, um, you know, we were able to share our research in that publication, which is, was then picked up and I was able to contribute to um, a BBC interview on this area. Um, and it was also picked up by The Guardian in thinking about COVID as a social crisis, which I think is a really critical element to, um, you know, acknowledge that COVID is very much as thought of a public health crisis, but it hasn't been acknowledged as deeply as a public social crisis. So I appreciate there's a lot of material there, but I hope I've been able to um, sort of complete the journey, if you like, within the time. And I'm, I'm very happy to respond to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, again, if anyone's got any questions, please just um, ask me. Or, oh. Um, I can see a hand from Elizabeth. Should I respond to that? Question from Elizabeth? 
It's not necessarily a question, Jane. It's more of a, a thank you. Um, as a law school uh, alumni and a master's student alumni who's been taught by you and now has the privilege of being your colleague in the law school, I just wanted to say thank you for all the work you've done from Law in Action to Clock and the work and the engagement I participated in that TIS exchange programme with India and the way that your, um, your passion and your drive to achieve social justice has helped me to develop my own passions and my own research and I just wanted to say a thank you for, for all that you've done for me in terms of developing me from a, an unconfident student to an unconfident academic shall we say but I just wanted to say thank you. Well thank you because without you it wouldn't be possible you know I, I think CLOCK is, is such a reciprocal collaborative practice I know Clifford spoke about that right at the beginning about co-creation and collaboration um, there's absolutely no way I could have done this on my own and and you as a student of Law in Action in the very, very early days um, and then as a master's student going out to India, you know, all of that knowledge transfer um, and the ripple effect um, ha has been absolutely critical and, and again I think when we think about impact, the impact on litigants in person's lives, but it, it's wonderful to hear about the impact in your life sounds rather big, but you know, on your learning journey um, and you know what you then have have been able to carry on in, in, in your work, which which is absolutely fantastic. So it's a very reciprocal thank you. Um, see Clifford has a yeah, so it, 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 but more again more a comment than a question. Um, but I just wanted to to sort of build on that that last point really, and um, sort of try to reflect as well how important it is we understand the drivers of where the impact comes from because the stories that we've told here really are, are very much about the impact itself you know for you in particular in a very powerful social justice mission um, and and for for Helen you know there's that very emotional story about connecting with these people and, and contextualizing their lives. And for me, it's a kind of reform agenda. And while we as an institution are, are striving to kind of capture this within the metrics, I just want to put out a plea to recognize how important it is not to interfere with that mission, because we're not doing this for an impact case study. We're doing it because we believe the value of our work and the social good that it does. And I think, you know, we've got to try to create a framework where we keep that intact because it's actually the real core driver of, of why we do this stuff and where the motivation comes from and where the joy and the pleasure comes from. I mean, what a lovely response to have from a student that, you know, you can achieve that with your work. And, and, and the point is there and it's true. It's about collaboration and it's about creating a framework of collaboration sort of moving forward. But it's also just to make the point as well, I think your, your, your presentation began with, with an issue that chimes with the research that I'm doing as well, because you know, looking at, at the impact of COVID and the impact of mass emergencies on collective identities and emergent resilience that flows from the ability of those collaborations to form in the wake of a disaster and, and how the state then intervenes in those contexts to scaffold or actually often destroy that, that resilience is, is a key research issue in our work as well. So as usual, you know, it's just really good opportunity to have a follow up conversation in a sense, because I think there's a clear opportunity for collaboration. But th thanks for a lovely presentation. Thank you, Clifford. And I just to respond, I just that was really interesting when you said about that mobilisation, collective mobilisation. And as I think in the post disaster area, there was a collective mobilisation because it was absolutely clear that everyone had suffered in the same way and, and came together. I think in the context of austerity and what we're experiencing, it's much more individualised and people feel very alone. Um, and working with people on a one to one basis as litigants in person, CLOCK has been really critical to be able to provide that collaborative response to bring things together and get their voices heard together and take their voices, you know, to that reform agenda. Um, so COVID, yes, I think has identified that we're in a public crisis, but still in the domestic setting, it's very individualised. So, yeah, I'm very, very, really happy to continue that conversation. Thanks.
Fabienne, I think, has a question. I don't know if you can see any more. But... Um, I just wanted to join in and um, congratulate you on what you've achieved. Fabienne, I can, I can disunderstand you, but you, you, you're, you're at high speed, I think. I, I know you normally function at high speed. <laughs> you sound like Pinky and Perky, Fab. <laughs> Oh, she's going to. Oh, I, I, I could actually. I, I could have actually tried to un listen. I don't know whether she's going to come back in. Sounds sound like she's been breathing methane now. <laughs> Is it methane? What's the gas? It's nitrogen, isn't it? Sorry, not methane. Helium. Helium. Helium that's that's cliff, cliff. Cliff. Flip, you're in. You're in the right cliff. discipline, clearly. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> did, did Felicity have a question now? Felicity, sorry, it's gone. It's really quiet. You, I can just hear you. Okay, right. So if you, if you can't hear me at any point, do. Um, I just wanted to echo. It kind of echoes what Clifford was saying in the Muslim now. Um, as a former legal. Oh, it's, I, I can't, can't hear it. Can you type it instead? Could you type it in the chat? Yeah. Fabienne, do you want to try again? Okay, I'll try again. Okay. Can you... no. <laughs> okay. Uh, I just wanted to kind of echo what others have said and just say that this has been an immense achievement, having been able to kind of watch you create this and co-create this um, since 2012. I joined in 2011, so it's been a pleasure to see how this has grown. But what I wanted to highlight here um, is to also say and acknowledge how much labor you have put into this. And also, I think we need to kind of say that people higher up need to be able to have a bit of imagination um, when these things start out, because it wasn't necessarily obvious from the beginning what this would turn into. And I remember that you faced a lot of adversity. And I think this also needs, I mean, we're all talking about the amazing achievement, but I also think we need to be very open while we have people here who are from senior management as well to just say that sometimes it's worth um, having a bit of faith and trust in people and letting them run with it. Because Jane's um, clock is an, is an example of what can be created but also at a huge personal cost as well, because it's not always been supported by the organization that is now also reaping the benefits of this. And I think that is something that we need to kind of highlight and mention uh, while we also celebrate this amazing achievement, because you have put in, you know, 365 days, nights, days, weekends, everything into this, and that keeping this, because essentially what clock is, is an infrastructure. You are basically, if you were a scientist, you would be running a lab, clock is a lab. And you are creating so many opportunities also for case studentships, talking as a DTP lead here, um, for people to, it's also a, a lab where people can then do research. So you're not just, uh, it's not just a social justice uh, it, it's, it's a project, it's also somewhere where people can actually hook up with partners. Uh, we have two case studentships that have come out of clock, or one, one case studentship and one other studentship. So Voices of Stoke came through you. Um, and so Laura Pritchard-Jones and Alison Brammer have a case studentship through that. So I think this is something that is, is so valuable and you've created this amazing infrastructure. And this is, um, just thought I'd, I'd, I'd acknowledge this be, uh, and, and mention this. Thank you, Fabienne. And I, I think, I mean, I, th I think the experience of CLOCK has been, um, I think at the very beginning, um, as you say, nobody knew quite what it would become. And I, I would say, you know, I, I do remember um, in the very early days, there was um, an opportunity to apply for um, the social um, innovation projects. Um, and actually, Mark was very supportive in that, Mark Omoroid, um, in those early days. But it was seen to be something very much on the side of research. It took a long time for me to have clock 
actually centered in as a research engagement for me it was always a research engagement it came from my research um, but it was very difficult for it to be positioned um, and at one point it was actually a little bit outside of my role and then um, the social innovation and it enabled me to do a tremendous amount on my own that that was very liberating because I was able to get a little pocket of funds which I could do a considerable amount with because it was slightly out of the um, formal infrastructure um, but at the same time it wasn't then recognized in that way so th there was a lot of uncertainty of quite where clock was and sat I'm deeply thankful to Mike Hessian. I think Mike Hessian was was absolutely critical within the research school for always identifying it as a research project and always being so. He he ha, he knew the impact agenda that I I didn't know. Like Clifford, I wasn't working towards an impact agenda. You know, Clifford's early research wasn't impact orientated, and um, I wanted to make a difference. That, that's my research. I was always the reason I wanted to be a researcher was to make a difference. Um, but I hadn't thought about it in how it could be formalised as an impact. So Mike Hessian um, and Sheena Bateman were, were fantastic. Um, but there were many times in my own career where it was a real question as well, was this research or not? Um, and I've, I've had to, you know, that, that, that's been a difficult um, sort of a position of vulnerability really because you know that the amount of work and energy and engagement is making you more and more vulnerable um in terms of your day job um so you know it, i think the impact the fact that it was it's been adopted as an impact case study has made clock very secure but we still struggle i mean it needed to be said really at the beginning that clock is a goodwill project in the sense that all of our collaborating partners contribute to clock on the basic of goodwill you know if anybody started charging at any point it would completely break um, because we just couldn't afford to do that um, so people people are committed to clock and I'm aware just as you've noted about my kind of emotional engagement that Kerry has highlighted in the chat um, in relation to Helen's work and I'm sure Clifford's work um, the emotional engagement of our students, the emotional engagement of our partners, the emotional engagement, you know, across, um, you know, the, 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 there's a serious um, uh, omission of, you know, when we talk about how we allocate and value work. Um, so, yes, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very hesitant always to, you know, I'm very mindful for those who may wish to engage in this sort of work because it is, it does demand a, a certain amount of commitment and labour which isn't necessarily visible um, or visible in the right ways um, in, and seen in the right ways uh, but I, I think as I say the impact case study has uh, has provided an opportunity to document um, what has happened I see Mark's great good question do I have time to respond it, yeah. it was really partly a, a just to kind of respond to Fabienne's point. I, th I mean, I think it's really an important point. And, and I think, in a way, Cliff touched upon this in, in his, his talk around, um, and we have in a couple of weeks, we've got a, a REF strategy uh, steering group review of, of the REF submission exercise and things to learn from. And I think one of the things that comes out and has come out this morning is, the really need to have a unit of assessment or discipline level, uh, a clear kind of collective approach of ownership of, of impact because, I mean, again, I think everyone here knows, but successful impact case study is, a, is equivalent to a large number of high quality outputs, and yet those people haven't necessarily always had the same resource for that, and, and it has relied too much, I would say, I would agree with you, Fabienne, on, on uh, entrepreneurial very particular individuals and put too much pressure on those without enough results I mean Jane's probably slightly different because because of that feeling of where clock clock sat that it's in the law school was a part of the research research agenda and so on Jane's always had a very clear view on that but I think it is true that that I think for the next ref we have to more properly identify our clear impact case studies that or or the ones that we really want to back and try and 
resource those in in a proper way. We can't resource everything, so it means taking stuff away from somewhere else. But but it too much does does fall on a smallish number of individuals, and that and that it does need a more collective and coherent approach. I think. Thank you. Does anybody else have any other questions, either directly for Jane or just comments or um, any sort of conversation? We're sort of done with, that case, um, done with the presentations now. Um, like I say, we've, we don't have a force, so if there's more conversation that wants to come out, we, we have got time. Or not, <laughs> if everyone is sort of done. Um, I think Kerry's put a note on the chat just talking about the individual burden, you know, how that was felt this time around. I mean, I also found it very, oh, sorry Kerry, do you want to? Oh, thanks Jane. Uh, well, yes, I've just put it in the chat, but as, a, as an impact case a study writer myself, uh, I mean, trying to polish up a pre-final draft during the pandemic with a child home from school and trying to teach honestly and trying to teach a new module new to me module at the same time and I'm sure I'm not alone in that <laughs> well I think also the fact that the work was most intense over the Covid time so um you know I, I think that's as Clifford mentioned as well when you're actually doing the work all the, I mean, you know, today we've got a case on. So whilst I'm in, you know, I'm getting messages on, on you know, a, a very um, difficult care case that's going on. For me, clock was 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 chasing time, um, trying to record what was happening for the purposes of the impact case study, but ensuring that I was always doing it and being true. And I think, you know, when you have goodwill collaborations. You, you're, you're being true to the partnership, true to the work, <clears throat> and it's you know it's difficult to do at the same time having to um, meet those targets that we were given. Um, yeah, so I mean, for me, I, I love and I'm very thankful to be. I feel very privileged to be in the university and have the opportunity to do the work that I do because I I love it and I have had significant support and I, you know I do really thank Mark you know from those very early days with, with with when clock was beginning and with the international partnerships as well but I do feel it was quite individualized you know I think Mark had a, a, a perspective on 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 the work that perhaps another manager wouldn't have um, and as I say over the period of um, the impact case study time things changed, you know, there was one time when I, I wasn't being considered at all as an impact case study. Um, and then through a change of lens, I was. So you, you carry on doing the work, I will always do the work, but you you don't know, you know, how it's going to be, the security and the vulnerability are the key issues. Can I just come in to reinforce that as well? I, I think for me, it was a very similar story. Uh, you remember that I referred to the work that I was doing was very focused on on trying to impact on football policing, and that basically mean meant I need to go to football matches to observe the policing operations. Now those policing operations were usually in distant parts of the country, which would take two to three hour journey to drive to. I paid for that fuel. I'd have to get up first thing in the morning to be in that distant location by sort of half nine, ten o'clock in the morning. I'd, and then I'd, I'd get back literally 10 o'clock at night after that journey. And I was doing that pretty much for periods of time where I wasn't basically giving up my entire weekend. I was getting, if I was lucky, one day off a week. And I'd have to do this in sequential series across, you know, a two month period. Literally exhausting. You know, it, it, and, and that level of personal sacrifice you have to make to deliver that impact goes well above and beyond what we're contracted to do, and it's completely hidden. Nobody acknowledges you're doing it. Nobody records that you're doing it. Nobody gives you the credit 
for the fact that you're doing it. And it's only, as you point out, Joan, because you get you come into, there's a different lens applied that means you're now an impact case study, that it starts to get some gravitas, it starts to get some traction, starts to get some strategic level support. But if you didn't have that, it wouldn't be there at all. And in a sense, it's that going above and beyond thing, that entrepreneurial thing that we've done as individual members of staff, that's a commit, more a commitment to our work than it is anything else, and the social value of that work that's produced this impact. And that has to be acknowledged. And we have to kind of emphasize that from my point of view, because it's fundamental to what we've achieved in, in this ref return with the impact case studies. Sorry to drone on, but just to reinforce the point, really. Yeah, I'll just, just, just echo that, Clifford. I'm on this uh, police expert advisors database and it says on there I'm, I'm available 24 hours a day seven days a week so I, I get emails at all times all weekends I'm expecting instant answers so it's not so you stick on a, a wham or whatever it's one of those things that you need to do to justify being on the on that system and pushing that forward for your case study so you know I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do it although <laughs> we said my family's probably less so when they're saying what are you doing on Saturday night as you're working yeah. through stuff but uh, that's just the way of things. Yeah, no, just to reinforce that again, I mean, I'm happy to do it. I love doing it. It's, it's what I love doing about my work. I'm not complaining in that sense. It's intrinsically valuable work for me. And I do see it's part of my professional status, expertise and position. But I'm just highlighting that objective tension about how we, how we deal with impact in the organisation. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not not don't want to sound at all defensive or about this because it's been absolutely fantastic kind of uh, session. And I mean, one thing we have done uh, probably sitting when I came into being PVC research role, impact was not well recognised at all. We have changed the promotion criteria so that demonstrating excellence around impact engagement is is there as a clear criteria and people that have done that, even if it isn't necessarily in the uh, making the kind of the the kind of the lens through being a, a ref impact case study, demonstrable impact, both academic, but particularly non non academic is 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 there as a of excellence. And I think I've, I can certainly think of a number of promotion cases that have been successful where that level of success around impact uh, is has been the thing that's really made the difference in terms of someone some getting promotion. I mean, I can't advocate people kind of devoting 24 seven to this. I mean, that that's the classic thing about academic workloads anyway. We, we're probably all academics uh, uh, for for diff, different different reasons, but but most academics do do put in a very significant shift because Whilst it doesn't necessarily always feel a privileged lifestyle, it does come with with some privileges in terms of able to direct your own 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 research. But I, I think there's been some very good points made, and and it is food for thought as to how you kind of start to identify and support areas pre becoming identified as a ref impact case study. I, I think because because people are investing huge amounts of time, we we have been able to support the impact case studies through generating an impact acceleration fund that, that we don't have as an institution. Now, actually, this afternoon, I've got a meeting with someone quite senior in EPSRC to try and negotiate a regional impact ac acceleration fund that, that Keel isn't part of because it's scale. They sit within Russell Groups primarily, and, and so uh, if we can get leverage some external research council funding to come in, then then that 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 would be that would give us more resource that we currently don't don't have. But, but there's still a way to go on that journey. But thinking about that pre ref impact case study, how we support that and how we create funds to be able to really um, workload, which is is the most important thing to support that is 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 actually been really useful to hear that or think about that. Okay, I can see Teddy and got another, uh, another point. No, um, just quickly, because I wanted to thank Mark for this. And I just wanted to kind of just add to that, that maybe sort of that in between those management levels that 
there is a kind of an openness to creativity because I think that you know when we when we're just thinking about because thinking about impact case studies that's obviously functionally driven as a function behind that but obviously the kind of that the 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 the, um, the substance of it is is driven in a different way as Clifford Stott already said and I was just thinking if there can be sort of an openness to let people be creative as well I know that we do this already but oftentimes there is there can be support and there can be support there can be support and there can be barriers that's what I'm trying to say that sometimes just you know if if we're thinking about it most of the times you just need to let people run with it not everything will come off there's always a risk and there's there's what, what I'm trying to get at that there is a risk there's a risk there but there's also kind of a personal risk to managers that we're also conscious of and that sometimes because of the way things need to be measured and outcome driven that sometimes maybe that I can I can appreciate the position that managers are in in terms of whether they let people run with it or not and I'm just thinking can, could there maybe be discussions around thinking about how the institution can support that creativity and not stifle it. I know it's I don't have an answer to it. Sorry, I'm just asking a question, <laughs> but uh, I just thought I'd mention that. And uh, is it Carrie? Sorry. Hi, thanks. Yeah, I was just picking. I'd just like to echo Fabienne's point, but also raise a question or make a point talking about creativity. Why is there nobody from the School of Humanities talking today? Um, yeah, I don't have that. I don't have a response to that. I'll just, I'll just put that question out there yeah. because I've been asked, and I, I, I don't know if any of my colleagues are either. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Does um, Does anybody else have any questions or points? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we have got um, the afternoon session will be starting at half past twelve. So I hope um, some people at least who've been in this morning session are able to um, to come along and support those colleagues who are speaking then. Um, I know Mark um, Mark won't be joining that session, so thank you, Mark, for um, coming along here, and thank you everybody um, for joining in and having some interesting discussions. Um, so I'll let you all. All go and have a break and hopefully return um, at half past 12. So thank you as well to everyone who's spoken. It's been really interesting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Great session. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for organising. No okay, see, see you in the afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.